Hey guys, what's up? It is week 70 right now, and uh, I want to start this off by uh, people brought to my attention uh, something about uh, Poltergeist 2 when I was talking about it. I reviewed that last week. They were like, well, you know, you mentioned that the older sister was not in it, and uh, you got aware that she was actually murdered by her boyfriend. That's why she wasn't in the sequel. And uh, I remember hearing something about that, uh, but I really hadn't, uh, I didn't remember it at the time. I remember there was something weird about her character being eliminated from the movie for a particular reason. But uh, that brings me to the question that I wanted to ask you guys. So uh, like last week, I'm going to ask you guys another question and uh, leave it at the screaming toilet YouTube and I'll read your answers for next week. My question is, everybody knows that the Poltergeist franchise is a haunted franchise. We have the uh, sister uh, from the uh, first film being murdered and then in the third film um we have um uh, zelda rubenstein's one of her uh, uh parents died uh, while filming that and uh heather wark of course died shortly after that and the second wolf samson didn't live too long after that one what are some haunted franchises or haunted horror films out there the movies that are actually haunted or people think are haunted i'm not very superstitious but movies that people think are haunted what are some ones that interest you like the poltergeist franchise is supposedly haunted like uh some strange things happen on the side of the actresses stuff like that uh I i'd like to read some of that let me know guys what information you have on it leave your answers uh below and i'll read them for next week uh, i'll read the uh answers for uh this week um uh, for last week's question with after uh the q a so um stay tuned for that uh the first one i want to review for you guys is the baby from 1973 this is the arrow release i had heard about the baby for years uh this is uh like the fifth release i've had of the baby but uh I hadn't watched it till until now, which I'm, I'm happy I checked it out. This is actually by Ted Post, who is uh, kind of an old Western director. He did Hang 'em High and Magnum Force. So uh, he had some cool titles to his name, uh, and he was a TV director. Um, yeah, this movie is very crazy. Um, it's a PG, which is very strange. Don't let that put you off. You know, like Blood and Lace is a PG as well back in the day. Jaws is a PG. Uh, crazy, crazy movie. Um, this is a kind of a psychological uh, horror movie. It's not even really a horror movie, almost like a demented family drama that has horror elements, but it's so twisted that it will appeal to horror fans or genre fans for sure. We have this social worker who becomes interested in this case of uh, this... Uh, man child who this family calls baby and it's a family it's a very uh, matriarchal family with a, a very stern mother and two daughters two grown daughters and their grown son and this grown son has a you know he thinks he's a baby and he's treated as such as well the social worker thinks that uh, you know they're basically pushing this on him they're treating him as such and keep him being forced in this little bubble that he is a baby so basically she uh, kind of intervenes and starts getting interested in the case, and everybody around her is telling her that you're you're taking this too deep, and and uh, you realize that there's something not quite right with this social worker either. So that's basically the setup of the movie. How it plays out is brilliant. Uh, there's great performances by everybody. Everybody's kind of bizarre and weird. It feels like they're in that kind of a uh, spider baby world, not as uh, over the top, but everybody is very strange. And this movie is very heavy for a PG. There's these weird uh, lesbian overtones at a time where one of the uh, ladies tries to pick up the social worker that's great all the uh the um, like the family the mom and the two daughters have these weird character traits and they're strange and you see what's actually happening to the baby and uh the twist at the end is brilliant it's great it's dark it's not as dark as i thought it was going but it's pretty damn dark uh the movie's very uh female driven and it was strange for ted post to direct something like this and it's a very interesting movie the special features on here are great. There's uh, uh, something with Rebecca McKendry from Shockwave. She goes into the movie and talks about it on an analytical level of how strange it is and whatnot. There's a commentary on here by Travis Crawford, and he basically does an internet movie database with all the people in the movie. Uh, and there's a lot of good actors in here, familiar faces. And he also talks about the relationship between Ted Post and Clint Eastwood and how it affected his career. That stuff's interesting. There's an inter uh, uh, archival interview with Ted Post, and it's pretty cool, and with the lead actor who played the baby. And there's also some other stuff 
on here, a new interview with uh, one of the actresses, which is really cool. They talk about working with a lot of the other people. It's a it's a pretty stacked edition. It looks really cool. There's actually two two uh, ways to watch it in the original cut, I believe, which is a, a more full screen and then the uh, widescreen. I'm not sure what it was shot in, but um, I, I imagine that uh, a lot of people think this uh, it, it kind of was maybe shot for full screen or most people are familiar with the full screen edit. I'm not sure, but uh, I, I really enjoyed it. It's very well acted, very dark, very creepy, a good, good psychological study. Um, there's really good scenes with lots of strange characters, but never do they hit that point where they're over the top. And uh, this definitely becomes a uh, kind of a deal between these two, this power struggle at one point where there's a switch in the movie and you're like, Oh no, I don't really know where I fall here. And, uh, <laughs> regardless it's a very entertaining very uh you know the only term to describe this is it's batshit and everybody uses that term it's a, it's probably overused term by me and a bunch of other people at this point but that's just so perfect for it it's batshit it's a crazy weird different movie but i really recommend checking out the baby this this uh release looks damn good it sounds really good uh like i said it, it's loaded with some new features it has all the old stuff on there uh really cool movie and i was very impressed with it very happy with it the baby there wasn't enough room in Toyland to escape the terror that rocked Baby's cradle. I notice you call him Baby, and the case history doesn't show any other name. What is his real name? Just Baby. To Baby, life was not a giant playpen. It was a living hell. He wasn't allowed to walk, he wasn't allowed to talk, but he was capable of it. Baby is a full-grown man trapped by three women with no way out. Damn you. to us. No, to me. He belongs to himself. He's not the subhuman thing you've made him. Scotia International Release, starring Angelette Comer, Ruth Roman, Mariana Hill, Suzanne Zenor, and David Manzi as Baby. Rated PG. <laughs> okay, the next one is also by Arrow, and this is Whores of Malformed Men. And uh, I also had had the old Synapse or Synapse DVD, and I had wanted to watch this for years. It was supposed to be very interesting. This movie's made 1969 in Japan, based off a famous writer's work. So we have that going for it. Um, the famous writer, um, I guess he was very um, influential in Japan. And this is, uh, I believe it's from Toei. Uh, yeah, Toei was one of the big Japanese companies in there. And uh, the director of this movie had gone on to do a bunch of things and worked all the way into the uh, early, like, 2010s, I believe, when he died. So he's an interesting director. He has kind of a cult following. And this movie is very, very strange. Um, 
what the director wanted to do was take one of the uh, writer's main stories, Rampo, uh, I can't think of his last name, but I'd probably mispronounce it anyways, but one of uh, his main stories and kind of add elements of his other stories in here as well and kind of create like a, uh, you know, a collection of his shorts in one movie. But it's, 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 a, it's a very strange film. We have this... Uh, character right in the beginning he's in a mental institution you don't necessarily know why he's there but he was like a fallen doctor that kind of lost his you know his his mind and uh he escapes and he runs into this girl and he know she's singing the song and he knows the song and he thinks it ties into where he's from he wants to figure out who he is he has amnesia so he um he gets um kind of pinned for these couple murders and he, while he's running he sees in the newspaper that this millionaire died that looked just like him on this coastal island that he's going to anyways or in this area so he goes there digs up his body uh, steals his uh, gown and it kind of uh, makes it look as if he's him reincarnated and uh, jumps in into this movie that's all in like the first 30 minutes of this movie this movie is pretty hard to follow in a lot of ways and it starts off kind of like this strange like film noir kind of mystery and then it just gets really crazy really surreal really odd what what what's uh, really strong about this movie is at the time it was doing things that a lot of other movies wouldn't do uh, uh, it's very graphic in the nudity department for what it is. It pushes a lot of boundaries. It does a lot of mutations and mutilations and stuff like that. Um, it's not like an all-round gore for us or anything, but it does things that a lot of other movies wouldn't do, and it has like a surreal attitude about it. Reminds me kind of also like the island of Dr. Moreau, uh, in a way, with the uh, weird experiments going on. He figures out that his supposed father is doing these experiments on this island, and he wants to go. He's not supposed to. All these other people tag along. All their identities are revealed to be someone who they're actually not. Um, the problem with this movie is, though, I know it's way ahead of its time. I know it uh, pushed boundaries, and I know a lot of people love it. I do not, but I appreciate it uh, for what it did. Um it, uh, basically, it has two huge moments in here that are just giant information dumps where the movie completely comes to a screeching halt and it explains the plot twice. And there are like 15, 20 minute segments here that explain the plot and make thing, make things that uh, make it make sense. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Tons of information dumps. It's really sloppily done. And this movie is definitely a kitchen sink approach. Like if he would have had the one story and that's what he went with, it would have been okay. But he tries to add all these other elements because he liked this writer so much and he wanted to do something special. And it's special, but it's weird. And it, it's really disjointed at times and very strange. But uh, there's lots of very memorable moments in the movie and there's really some really cool iconic imagery and it gets really really crazy and silly and if you can like you know surrender yourself to the goofiness and not find it as goofy as it actually is you probably will enjoy it more but um fireworks ex uh, flying heads at the end um mutated half put together people siamese twins you name it it's in here um it was never really released in japan due to all this stuff it was very controversial and uh they would import the american synapse dvd or synapse dvd so yeah it's a very unique movie there's two audio commentaries one new on here and one old one from the old uh, dvd there's the arc uh archival interviews with a uh, director of tetsuo and another uh famous kind of cult director on here talking about their appreciation there's of the director and his work and there's a, a kind of a fun thing where they take uh the director of this movie when he was still alive on like this tour of his movies and whatnot in italy it's an interesting movie like i said and it has some nice uh features on here it looks really good it's a good looking movie and uh, it's got a lot of cool things going for it it's just too too all over the place for me to actually like find enough footing to enjoy it and those moments where it just stops to explain the plot are like oh wow this is really sloppy and it, it wouldn't be accepted in any other movie i know this movie is special in a lot of other ways and probably helps it be forgiven more but it still shouldn't be accepted in this one either but uh I mean, there probably weren't many movies doing anything like this, even like that at the time, so it, it, maybe it's unconventionalism really helped anyways with that weird information dump. Regardless, uh, there's lots of iconic stuff in here. It's just, uh, and it's a nice release, and I, I recommend checking it out, but uh, it might not be for you. about uh, this particular scene 
the, the the set design of it and this incorporation of human beings into um, into the set. Horror of Malfour Men came out around Halloween of 1969. That same year, Ishii made uh, seven films altogether. この危険人間たちは解放だ。危険人間が王様だ。そして美しい女たちを集めて好き放題に暮らすんだ。そんなことはさせ。Okay, guys, we have another from Arrow, the Pajama Girl case. This is another one that I've always wanted to see, but I never watched until finally Arrow put it out. This is a very unique giallo, and I don't even want to call it a giallo, the way its structure is. But it is a murder mystery movie. It is Italian. It does have like those kind of musical cues and the filming styles of a giallo, but it's not really a giallo. What we have here is these two storylines going on uh, throughout the movie. They cut back and forth. They don't really seem to intermingle until about the 25% uh, mark in the movie. And then we're like, oh, oh, we know exactly what's going on now. At least I did. And I don't want to say anything besides that and spoil it for you, but the film is basically, it starts right off with a body being found on a beach of a, a young girl or a, you know early 20s. Her face is mutilated. She's wearing these yellow pajamas, and that's all. And it cuts to these detectives trying to figure it out. They put the body on display, which is supposedly a real story that happened in Australia, which is what makes it also interesting as this movie is based on fact and fiction, of course, as all film is partially at least fiction but they put it, the woman in the case to see if anybody can identify the body and that's basically the setup of this movie without go, going giving up too much uh it goes back and forth to these two stories and at the very end you know exactly what's happening uh it's shot really well and at a lot of points there's lots of handheld stuff and the camera's just moving a little bit here and there and it gives it this like uh energy to me it gave me a lot of energy it's for, every every scene looks beautiful like i was like i was watching it and i was like i don't know why it looks so damn good but this one really looks good everything looks top notch in the movie i was kind of impressed with how it looked and i'm most italian films look great especially giallos but this one was a little bit better in a lot of spots it has ray milan in it um and this is kind of like one of those deals where this uh um you know foreign actors coming to italy and he's slumming it up and he it was big in america and now he's here he plays this kind of a retired detective who can't relax and he wants to basically be in uh you know in the police force still and solve this crime and uh, he's great in it. He's funny. Almost all the best scenes involve him, his humor. Um, he's having a lot of fun in this role, I think. And uh, he's a great presence in the movie. He has a lot of charisma. He has a lot of, uh, you know, the right amount of comedy and the right style of comedy to go in this movie. And, and there's a point in the movie about an hour that something happens that you're just like, oh, that that makes me not want to finish this movie without giving too much away. I was like, I really was like, oh man, I liked it. I liked a lot of things that were going for it and then it has a complete change there and I'm like, that hurts a lot. But it also has a familiar face for me was the asshole doctor in Cannibal Apocalypse. I'm not sure if he's necessarily a bad guy in that movie, but he's going against John Saxon, which makes me not like him. But uh, he's in this and I don't like him in it. But no, he plays a kind of a smug detective, a younger detective. We have that old versus young thing going on. I like that. Riz Ortolani, for some reason, last week I called him Ritz. I go back and forth. I sometimes will mistakenly call him Riz, Ritz, and I usually call him Riz. But his name is Riz Ortolani. As he explains in the special features of this Blu-ray, uh, to finalize it for me, but Riz Ortolani does the music in here, and it's wonderful. It's a beautiful score. And uh, the, he does one of the scores with... Um, uh, a singer in here, Amanda Lear, and she sings these two songs that play throughout the movie. They're really great. And uh, half of this movie, uh, it unfolds the story of this girl and this uh, girl and uh, this relationship that she has and all the people she has relationships with. Mel Ferreira is being one of them as well. He's always a welcome face in tons of movies. But uh, what's really 
beautiful is they take these people and they, they're not perfect people and you feel sorry for them, especially the girl. And uh, they film this sex scene in here. It's got to be the most disgusting sex scene, unappealing sex scene I've ever seen in my life. It's just, uh, and the, the way they choose to, what they focus on in this sex scene is is very, uh, very uh, provocative and very memorable. And it's, uh, it, it's, it works really well. It really takes the movie apart from being something really sleazy and it makes it really good. And that's what I let the commentary in here, what Troy Horworth says in here too. He says like the way they film this is perfect. And uh, the commentary is always great with him. He goes down the, the list of people and discusses what they've been in and whatnot. And I, I like Troy Horworth. He makes me laugh. He added a joke here and there. And I, I never think it's over the oh, pushing the boundary. I always think it's the right level of uh, joke that he does. And uh, he tries to have fun with it, you know, because he is spitting out a lot of information information at the time. And uh, I, it's always an informative commentary. I was very impressed with uh, the special features they on here. Of course, they have Riz Ortolani, which I'd never seen an interview with Riz. And it's uh, a long, great interview. And he goes into depth about his career and how he became a musician. It's just really good stuff. I really highly recommend that stuff. But then there's also an um, interview with uh, assistant editor on, well, one of the, the editor on here. And he talks about his uh, relationship with the director who has passed. Um, there's one with the cinematographer on here, I believe. Or was it? I can't remember. But there's like... Uh, a couple of the actors on here too and they, they're at like 20 30 minutes they go about their career they talk a lot about this movie it looks really good and i was very impressed with the movie to be honest I, I really liked it there's also a nice little piece on here about the internationalism of giallos and that's also interesting especially if you watch a lot of these giallo movies but i'd really recommend checking this one out especially this release i was very impressed with it and i i really enjoyed it it's a really cool movie and one of the better most interesting giallos i've seen especially in the style it's done i mean you see a lot of these giallos and you think they bleed together because it's the same similar story you've seen it a hundred times but this one will stick out because it's a completely different structurally and it's cool <laughs> This is a beautiful shot. It's a very painterly composition. Uh, Placido and De Lazaro framed by that dead tree there. Italian audiences had this kind of perception that if it was an English language film, it would be, or if it originated in an English speaking country, it would be more, a more quality product. Okay, guys, the next one here is from the Vestron uh, video label. And this is H.P. Lovecraft's Dagon, directed by Stuart Gordon, written by Dennis Paoli, and, uh, of course, produced by Brian Yunza. This one came a lot later than the other two Stuart Gordon ones he did. I mean, the Stuart Gordon H.P. Lovecraft collaborations are whatever Stuart Gordon directed movies uh Reanimator, which is a classic, and From Beyond, which is a classic. I'd never seen Dagon. I read the short story by um, H.P. Lovecraft, but this is more based on The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which I've also read. Um, so, yeah, this is a very strange movie. This was shot in Spain instead of taking the New England approach where the original story took place. It uh, doesn't star Jeffrey Combs or uh, Brad, uh, Barbara Crampton like it originally was supposed to if it had been made in the 80s. But, um, yeah. This is a this is a strange movie. If you get anybody's familiar with H.P. Lovecraft's work, um, with the fish uh, kind of aquatic people, um, that's basically what this is. We have this um, group of uh, Americans. They're um, on this fishing trip. Well, not necessarily Americans, but you know. American touristy types and this boat in a, and uh, they hit this rock and they start sinking and they have to go to this strange island and right away something's not right. All the people in here are kind of strange looking. They act strange and they immediately get separated. The lead in here is kind of a, a weird what he's doing. He He's not your typical lead at all. He has like a sense of comedy to him but he reminds me of Jeffrey Combs kind of mixed with a Bruce Campbell but playing like in a nerdy way. Uh, he, he takes a little while to get used to and I don't 
don't dislike them. It's just I've never seen a performance like quite like this, which is probably a positive thing, actually, if you think about it. But uh, he has these strange dreams, and of course, it ties into the original story and ties into the end of the movie. But what's really cool about this movie is the atmosphere. It's definitely all about the atmosphere. It's constantly raining. It's wet. Uh, the way they shoot the creatures, the way the creatures move, the way the like half man, half creatures move, and there's just tons and tons of atmosphere here. The rundown buildings, uh, everything is just wet and amphibious and it works really well and especially being off in this like coastal kind of area not coastal but like kind of isolated island in like a spanish area it, it sets it up to be scary too because the lead actor can't communicate with anyone he doesn't speak the language and he's alone and separated he runs into this last man on this island the Mboka island and uh this guy basically on re and reveals to him what happened on this island and what dagon is and that scene is although you know it would be a big information dump typically and you're like oh this sucks but they do they do it in this like elaborate flashback and it's very cool and the actor playing uh the the last man of a the last evoking man actual human is a tremendous actor i guess he was like a classic spanish actor he's really good in the movie and his demise is very powerful stuff all in all, it's a really uh, kind of cool movie, and for the time it was made, there they, they it does feel a little older than it should, but that's a good thing. It, it, it kind of channels that old Stuart Gordon H.P. Lovecraft style like the other two do, but it does feel a little bit cheaper, and there is some really bad CGI, unfortunately, towards the end of the movie, and it... it it's not very good and it, it does feel like it uh the character kind of escapes a couple more times than you would expect to and it just doesn't feel exactly perfect uh the the actress from shrew's nest is in this it's uh, Mar I'm marisa uh, marisa i can't remember her name but she's also in a couple other movies but she's in shrew's nest this is her first role she's pretty good in this one um and she's great in shrew's nest but yeah uh just a strange kind of unique movie about uh definitely uh, never being able to escape your fate uh but also done in this like creepy kind of atmospheric horror movie with like fishmen. There's not enough movie with like fish people, and uh, I, I don't know why. I love it to be honest. I, I think it's really cool, but uh, I think the atmosphere is very strong on this one, and uh, some of the performances are solid. Not all of them are perfect, and it, it's it. I don't love the movie, but I like it uh, quite a bit. And I think that if I would have saw it when it came out, I'd have been even more impressed because they weren't really doing anything quite like this. Uh, there's a new interview with uh, Brian Yunza and Stuart Gordon on here, which were interesting. And and uh, there's some other stuff on here. There's the two old commentaries ported over, which are also interesting enough. Stuart Gordon's one of those highly intelligent guys that you can listen to talk forever. But Dagon, I was happy with it. I thought it looked pretty good. I thought it sounded pretty good, except the CGI looks pretty terrible. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting movie. And um, I think that uh, it's a nice release. And I'm not uh, unhappy that I saw it. I do wish it was made in the 80s with, us, with uh, uh, Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton. But uh, I'm glad we got this, at least. It's pretty cool. And I must say this. I'm always bad -mouth from Stuart Gordon. I love Stuart Gordon movies. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to say that, but I'm always like, they're not very H.P. Lovecraft, are they? They're way too highly sexualized because Stuart Gordon is like the highly sexualized director in H.P. Lovecraft. He's like asexual. His like, sex is hidden way, way underneath, maybe. But here... This feels a lot like a Lovecraft story. This is probably the most faithful adaptation of a Lovecraft story I've seen, especially in Stuart Gordon's realm. But uh, in general, it's really close, I think. it's pretty, And that's very impressive to do, because that's not easy. Do you hear that? It's coming from that village. Probably some sort of religious festival. Hey, that thing's coming right at us. There's something in the water. We're gonna have to take the raft into that town for help. Where the hell is everybody? Hello? We need help. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> Who are you? I've been waiting for you. We'll go soon to a beautiful place, forever. You want to tell me why this is happening? Dagon needs her. <gasps> You're a bunch of freaks! I'll kill you all!
okay, the next here will be a Burt Reynolds uh, double feature. R.I.P. Burt Reynolds. He died, uh, and I watched these. These are like a week behind, but, uh, you know, legendary actor. Um, you know, he was also a director. Uh, can't say enough good things about Burt Reynolds, except that I probably haven't seen enough of his movies to appreciate him fully, but what I've seen, I've liked, and he always has a great screen presence. Movie's always good, even if the... He's always good, even if the movie isn't. But the first one, White Lightning. Uh, you know, this is one of uh, Burt Reynolds' big, uh, you know, hits. And Burt Reynolds was, like, ruling the box office in the 70s. And this is Hicksploitation. I love Hicksploitation. Uh, White Lightning, or Gator. He plays Gator McClowski in here. He's put in jail for selling White Lightning, Moonshine. And uh, he finds out that his brother was killed. So he tries to escape prison unsuccessfully and ends up working with the uh, federal government to bring down the guy he thinks is responsible for his brother's death and he goes undercover and kind of turns on his own people a little bit but uh, the way he handles himself it's like he's never dislikable you love him every time Burt Reynolds has a certain charisma about him and he's very smart how he handles his characters you never hate his characters and they're very um, you know what am I looking for here they're very like well thought out like a, a, like these, a lot of these actors are going to handle their characters well to win the audience over like uh, White Lightning, basically, Burt Reynolds is going up against this fascist uh, sheriff in Ned Beatty, who's great in this role, by the way. He's tremendous, as he always is, playing the heavy. But he's going against him in this movie. And uh, the sheriff hates communism. And this movie's made in the 70s, remind you. And it, it has, like, the hippies are basically being killed by this, you know, or exploited or attacked by this uh, fascist uh, sheriff. And, uh, you know, because I imagine that in the South that a lot of the, the time people are like, they don't like uh, the sheriff because he's a, a jerk. But they also don't like hippies and they don't like the whole communist thing. And, and Gator McClowski in this movie doesn't fall into any of that stuff. He's, he's like, uh, he's fighting against the fascism, but he's also you know, a good old boy in here. So it's like, it's very appealing to a lot of the drive-in crowd at the same time. And then when it goes up north, it probably plays really well too. And he's really careful, uh, you know, he, that he doesn't truly like really offend anyone. But um, in this movie, I, I love seeing a lot of the familiar faces like Matt Clark and uh, R.G. Armstrong and Bo Hopkins. It was great. Ned Beatty's uh, tremendous in this movie, but all those guys are really great in it as well. Burt Reynolds is charming as hell. There's lots of good car chases, lots of real, real dangerous stunts in there. Hal Needham was the second unit director and the stuntman, one of Burt Reynolds' buddies. He directed Cannibal Run, I think. So the, the stunts are crazy in here. Ned Beatty is tremendous in here. I, I love seeing him. He's just uh, this all around, like, you know, white trash piece of crap and he's just great and the way he handles himself he like holds his temper in at times and he's like ma'am you're gonna have to leave because i might be losing my temper and he's just <laughs> i love him in this movie and like i said burt reynolds is also great in the movie and you're you're on his side throughout the whole damn thing really cool stuff and it's one of these things that's pg but it really shouldn't be because you know there's like glove interest and whatnot and uh you know some violence and what and there's a really great moment with rg i'm strong in here i'll get he in there where much. he pulls a Shut knife on burt ass. reynolds and burt reynolds says how would you like it if I shoved that up your ass? And R.J. Armstrong says, I don't think I like that at all. <laughs> it's just really good stuff. Like and there's also an interview with Burt Reynolds on here, which I love seeing. And he talks about the movie and how it was like a big hit and how it like helped him branch out. Really cool stuff. Nice release. Um, uh, that's the only feature on here, but it has subtitles, so that's really cool. I have something for you on Friday, Mr. Connors. Bet this machine uh, outrun about anything, wouldn't it? Yeah. Motorcycles and state police cars. Just about anything on the road. <laughs> it's a hot car. <laughs> it's tuned up fine, huh? Only two things in the world I'm scared of. I'm scared of two things? What's that? Women and the police. <laughs> Women and the police. You spend all your time trying to hump them both, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you can take it easy in this machine in this county now. Oh, yeah, we'll take it easy, Mr. Connor. I know you will. Women and the police. Gator McCluskey. You know why I'm here, don't you? I said you know why I'm here, don't you? 
Bird Reynolds is Gator McCluskey. He's a booze running, motor gunning, law breaking, love making rebel. He hits the screen like a bolt of white lightning. Whether he's racing the law. Gonna be in trouble now. Or chasing the ladies. I don't believe in fooling around, man. You want to just say so. <laughs> Gator's the fastest thing alive. Ooh, now I know why they call you Gator. Only two things in the world I'm scared of. What's that? Women and the police. He's got a score to settle with the Bogan County Sheriff. No sheriff is gonna kill any brother of mine. Man, you better come with us then, huh? He's a damn tough cookie. He run Bogan County. I'm gonna get mean, Harvey. I'm gonna get that sheriff, man. You have to kill him. And he means to do it one way. <laughs> or another. All units, got a man heading after Jackson Road. Cut him out. Bird Reynolds is white lightning. He never strikes twice, because once is enough. The next one here is the sequel, Gator, made a few years later, actually directed by Burt Reynolds. And I'm going to get this off my chest. This one is a little bit goofier, a lot goofier than White Lightning, although White Lightning has its humor. This one is uh, a little bit sillier. And when it opens up, it's like it almost forgot the beginning of the, the first movie. You're like, I don't, that's not his father from the first movie. That's not how, I don't know. It has a whole new dynamic. I, and there's like got to be a lot of time that has passed in here. Burt Reynolds is now living out in the swamp and he's growing a mustache. And basically this New York uh, guy comes in, this federal New York guy. It's very similar to the same plot and he wants him to roll over and sneak in and uh, turn in an old friend of his named Jerry Reed who's basically Bama McCall who's running the, this town down there and working with Dub Taylor who's this crooked uh, politician. He wants the, him to roll over on them to get rid of them or his family's going to suffer for it. And so he basically infiltrates this gang along with uh, the the New York guy coming down with him. Hijinks ensue with those two because it's like, you know, mixing oil and water. And that's basically the plot of the movie. Burt Reynolds is funnier in this one. There's a lot more comedy. It's a lot goofier. and But it's all around a, a really good time as well. Jerry Reed as the main bad guy is great in it. He's really intense, really scary. Uh, love seeing him. But his goons are really weird and silly and almost feel like from a completely different movie smiley and bones and yeah they're just so weird so bizarre the interactions that he has with this uh this crazy lady who knows has knows uh, the files to turn these guys away forever is great she's like this crazy cat lady and i literally laughed out loud many times uh, with her interactions with burt reynolds where they're trying to sneak in and steal these files and uh she's like i gotta bring my babies and burt reynolds is like we're not bringing the cats she's like i'm not going he's like all right, get the cats. It's just so funny. Uh, it's just tremendous. Uh, the love interest between him and uh, the, the woman in this movie works really well. And uh, I, I actually wanted to see the happy, happy ending in here. And when the crazy bad stuff does happen, you feel real bad because you like the characters. And the bad guy has a great way of, you know, like kind of like being interesting and like, cool but also a monster at the same time and uh the way they kind of start like revealing more of his character uh and you're just like oh he's disgusting as hell and how burt reynolds is like working for him to infiltrate the gang and he starts to see how it's like hurting all these people and uh like the lower income african americans and stuff and he just starts to get disgusted with it and sees how he he's like having this like weird like drug prostitution thing going not necessarily prostitution but drug thing taking advantage of young girls he starts getting sicker and uh you know burt has a lot of good moments in here and again smart uh 
uh, how he played his character to try to be sympathetic towards all these different kinds of people and be like the hero, although he's also uh, anti-hero as well. It's just, uh, you know, I wish we had more anti-heroes now. Like, we don't, like I saw that 42nd Street Pete posted this on Facebook about when Burt Reynolds died. He said, you know, Clint Eastwood and uh, Lee Van Cleef and like Charles Bronson and Burt Reynolds. We don't have these anti-heroes anymore. And I was thinking, we don't. Like, I can't think of any anti-heroes in movies anymore. I didn't grow up during that time, but I grew up watching all these movies and seeing old movies and those kind of characters always appealed to me. So now when I see like actors and people are like, who are some of your favorite actors? I'm like, that are still working. They're still relevant. I guess I don't want to use the term relevant because I don't watch new movies typically, but when the new movies, I'm like, nobody really excites me like they used to. Some directors do, but no actors. Like when I was a kid, I'd be like, Oh, tell these balls and I'm going to run it. You know, that's how I was. Um, you know, but uh, it's not the same anymore, but, uh, there's also an interview again, the second part of this interview with Burt Reynolds, love seeing that really cool stuff talks about this movie talks about directing talks about you know how acting got in the way of his directing but uh Bert's the man really entertaining stuff not as good as White Lightning probably as a film but just as entertaining in a different kind of way but love them both really cool stuff I uh, look forward to checking more Burt Reynolds stuff out but uh for now that'll do ladies and gentlemen Burt Reynolds making his directorial debut on the new motion picture Gator for my first film as a director, I didn't want to make just another Burt Reynolds movie. I wanted to make a serious film about close personal relationships. I wanted to avoid sex. You charmed the shirt right off my back. I wanted to stay away from violence. I didn't want any wild chasing. No hair-raising stunts. No fight scenes. I want to make a film about quiet times in the country and the little things that make life worthwhile. But United Artists didn't want to make that picture, so we made Gator instead. Gator McCluskey, now we know you're in there. We coming to get you, Gator. Okay, guys, the next is the VHS Voyage. To be honest, man, I, Hollywood's new blood. This is a bootleg. It's probably very expensive VHS. But you know what? I bet this is uh, this is a shot on video. Only fans for low-budget body horror. This is probably a shot on video. Regardless, it was edited on video. It doesn't look particularly good. The plot of this movie, not very good. We have a group of... Uh, um, young kids who go out, uh, actors, young actors who are out in this, uh, weird cabin and they're taking this, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Seminar to learn how to act by this older guy. And, uh, there's this weird, strange history, a ghost story, if you will, about this house being the wrong house being rigged to explode and a bunch of a whole family of eight died or disappeared in the woods. And of course, three of them were never accounted for. That's the plot of the movie. The three guys are still stumbling through the woods with burnt crap on their face and like some pizza sauce or something to make them look like they've been cut up and they start picking off the actors and actresses this movie was so bland and boring i can't remember if there's even nudity in it but it does have the guy from uh, demon wind in it the the big kind of muscle jerk head he's in this and he plays the main guy not a jerk head but a big muscle guy um the special effects aren't particularly great the characters aren't particularly great every once in a while there's a moment of unintentional humor and intentional humor uh the acting is pretty bad in it uh but it's not horrible. It's not the worst ever. Uh, it's just not a very memorable movie. The kills aren't done particularly well. It's very, very short, but very boring at the same time. There is a couple moments that kind of surprise you in here, the way one of the main bad guys is killed, and uh, that's pretty decent. And I don't mind the setup. I mean, it's a simple slasher setup, and I don't have any problem with that. It's just the execution is not done in a particularly great way. It's a dirt cheap movie, so you can't expect miracles. But also, you, you can't expect at least a little bit of entertainment. And it's not, it's, it doesn't really do that very well. And the end of this movie, it ends at about like 60, 62 minutes. And then it proceeds to recap the movie with this real, the worst song I've ever heard in my life. Here, listen. Yes. Hollywood bows to the flood of new blood. Yep. That's, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're doing now. Isn't that the worst song you've ever heard in your damn life? But yeah, it plays for like 10 minutes going over what just happened just so they could get the runtime. You know that the people are like, this movie has to leave me 75 minutes. And they're like, we only got 60. What are we going to do? So that's exactly what happened. Kind of like the shot on video movie Sledgehammer. It's like, let's just turn everything into slow motion. That'll add 10 minutes. 
But uh, instead, this one, they're like, let's just end a recap of the movie and put this really terrible music over it. So that's what they did. It's, it's a really bad, bland slasher that, uh, you know, it's for uh, low-budget or fan completist only, or slasher fan completist only. But uh, that's Hollywood New Blood. Oh, where the hell's the car? Ah, oh, Randy and Jolie got it, huh? Hmm. Well, what I need is a cold shower anyways. The lake will have to do. Oh, son of a bitch! Now where the hell's the damn lake? It reminds me, I gotta take a piss. To pee or not to pee, that is the question. Whether... Yo, Randy, Joe, there you are. Back in there, fella. You guys, yeah, you're up here swinging while I'm stuck. Hey, get, get up, lovebirds. Stop messing with my mind. Okay, guys, the pick a movie here was called Kill Game. And this, I can't remember who picked it, but I watched it on Amazon Prime Streaming. So, uh, yeah, this one, Kill Game. I think it was made in like 2015, and the setup sounds like it's just like out of Slaughter High. It's uh, a group of uh, uh, pranksters, old pranksters, uh, a couple of, they come back to town for a funeral of somebody who is murdered, and uh, they start to get picked off one by one in grisly ways. That right away, I was like, well, it's, you know, the old prank gone wrong, and that person's come back for revenge, you think, deal. But it's newer, so it has more of a, a newer flash to it. What I'll say about this movie, to be brutally honest, is a lot of these kills in this movie are mean-spirited as hell. 
This one's also runs a little longer than expected. The acting's not always perfect in here. They set up tons of people that you think might be the actual suspects in the movie. And uh, it, it's kind of sloppy in a lot of spots, to be honest, like plot ways and plot uh, things. And they do that whole deal where a character in the flashback is killed and then his uh, a twin comes and it's the same actor and they don't establish that there was any twin's brother. So it's like, oh my God, that's so cliche and so bad. It's like, why are we doing this? Are we still doing this? I guess we're still doing this. But they do that and it, it wears out its welcome real fast. Um, but uh, to be surprised, right in the beginning of the movie, one of the first kills, somebody gets set on fire and I was like, oh my God, hanging up naked. A guy hanging up naked gets set on fire and I was like, this movie is already pushing the boundaries of what I expected it to be. The killer wearing the, ma the mask is actually fairly creepy. They set it up so you really don't know who the killer is and I guess it's kind of a surprise to be honest and there's tons of suspects so that's always nice. Like I said, it just doesn't it's way too long 10 minutes should be cut uh the kill scenes in the movie are very brutal and uh very very uh for for this kind of newer movie and uh most of it i think is practical there is some digital effects if i remember correctly that were kind of uh, towards the end but uh to be honest uh there is some decent practical effects in the movie um it's just a little sloppy and a little boring and it's just very cliche. But besides that, it's not an absolutely horrible movie or anything, but it's, it's very lackluster, you know, right below average for me. Uh, the killer is interesting. The setup is very typical. The kills are a little bit more mean spirited than expected. The story unfolds a little sloppier. It has so many of those trite, cheap things added in there. But I did appreciate some of the things that they went and went that extra step. And the ending I kind of liked at the same time. But it's it's very melodramatic too. At the same point where you're like, are we? Oh, we're gonna do those melodramatic moments where it's just almost too corny for its own good and like almost where you want to laugh soap opera style. But I I didn't hate it. I I didn't love it, but uh, I think it might be worth checking out, especially it's like a mixture of like new movies and the 80s movies and then even like that 90s like face on the cover floating head style movie. It's like all those mixed and some of it works, some of it doesn't. It's just a little below average for me, but uh, I would watch the director's next movie. people were killed last night. Sheriff, can you tell us anything? Are the victims from Grace Harbor High School? Well, we're still identifying the body. Did Blake ever do anything back in high school that would make someone want to hurt him? I think this has something to do with high school. Whoever it is didn't appreciate their sense of humor. Jesse and Blake were murdered. We can't go to the cops. The sheriff thinks someone is getting revenge. We're being targeted. The only way we get out of this is if we find out who's doing the killing. What if he's watching us? Can you think of anyone, Ryan? Something you might have done? A pecker boy from the bathroom? <laughs> Donald Buckley? It was high school, Helen. He <laughs> don't do stupid things. I hope you die. I'm leaving town for a couple days. We're gonna stick together, all right? If you don't do that, we die. This is supposed to be a prank. I didn't know he was gonna die. Drop the weapon! It was an accident! Okay, guys, let's get into the pick a movie. Uh, so, if you ever want to enter this, just uh, leave a comment below in the YouTube channel or Screaming Toilet on Facebook or wherever, and I'll enter you in. You don't come out of the bag until you're drawn, so don't re enter until after you're drawn. Dracula has great taste one last time. Still hasn't gotten back to me what he wants, but here we go. What do we got here? Jason Willard. Actually, no, Jason. Nice guy. Big fan of Dustin Mills movies. That's how I know him. But, uh, yeah, congrats, buddy. Let me know what you want me to watch. Maybe a martial arts movie that I have? I know you love martial arts movies. Maybe. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to start with the uh, questions asked first before I get into your guys' answers for last week. Last week's question was, what are some duds in the franchise that... Uh, I'll get to it again. But Okay, the questions are, Mike L., what is your opinion on films coming out now that try to be throwbacks to the 70s and 80s? Summer of 84, Let the Corpses Tan. Um, 
I like some of them, but when they first were coming out, I was like, oh, I love this. I love this gimmick. I'm into it. I'm totally into it. But it kind of wore out its welcome like every other horror trope. You know, like when something comes out and it's new and refreshing, it's done, beaten over the head to death, and that's with everything. But so if you're going to be a throwback now, you have to be exceptional. You have to do it really well or do something clever or something unique and something different. So it's, it's, at first it was pretty easy to get recognized by doing that. Now it's gotten harder. So the ones that are going to get recognized for that are probably going to be very good. Do you think the cannibal genre could make a real comeback or is it dead uh, for good after the Green Inferno? Like jungle cannibal movies? Probably not. I can see jungle adventure movies more in like a lighthearted vein coming back. Like, uh, you know, like Indiana Jones in the jungle. I could see that coming back, but I don't see the cannibal movies coming back because what made those movies so interesting was, you know, uh, honestly, the shock value and the survival and taking that like actor and putting him out there in the wilderness for real. And I just don't think they make movies like that anymore. And it, it's probably be for the better to not like definitely the animal killings for real. That's definitely for the better, but like also probably safety issues. That's why you don't see as many practical effects or squibs because the digital effects are safer on top of that. And on top of being easier at times, you know, on, on the film set, but it's just, I don't, I wish it would, but I don't think it's ever possible to be honest. And uh, I even appreciate the Green Inferno for trying to do it, even though I hate it. But I appreciate what he was trying to go for. It just was a failure for every and everything for that. Are you going to cinema, make a Cinema Wasteland mini video again this year? Probably not, but I'll probably record some stuff there. Uh, I, I've been so busy the last times I've been there. And, and, and I probably won't have the time, but... I'll have like videos that I'm there and like that I shoot there with interviews with people and stuff like that. So there'll be videos from Cinema Wasteland, but not of the convention itself. John Wilhelm, what are your thoughts on 4K? Will you make the switch? I really haven't got the dive into 4K as much. I did watch some stuff streaming 4K and I bought a 4K player. And like if I watch 4K disc on there, I think I've watched like one. It looks pretty good. But if I put one of my Blu-rays in there, there's a lot of like, there's lots of uh like, what is the word I'm looking for? Lagging and stuff like that, like ghosting. It looked like shit, so I put my other Blu-ray player in there, my upscale one. So, like, I have a 4K TV, and I will make the switch eventually, but I need either a new 4K player or I need to only watch 4Ks in that, and it's a pain in the ass, and I haven't really watched that many. But um, if it comes to that point where it's, like, the same price to buy the 4K or buy the regular, buy the 4K, or a few dollars more, I'll buy the 4K. So... Tim Hayes, you were allowed to watch Nightmare Helm Street as a kid because I mentioned that last week. Yeah, I was. Some, somewhat. Maybe not. I wasn't allowed, but I did. Surprised you even wanted to. What Wasn't that a bit too scary for a kid to watch? Oh, I was obsessed with anything I could. Anything they would let me watch. I was never scared when I rented them. Anything I thought that they would let me rent, I would rent. I wasn't afraid. It's just that uh, my mom would always be like, ah, when you're older. And uh, I would come back the next week or the next day and say, Mom, I'm older now. What about now? What about now? And I think just uh, I wore on her. I wore on them, both my parents, you know. And, uh, you know, I think they eventually caved in on a lot of the stuff. Nick Mua, you said that some foreign directors can't quite capture the American spirit. What is the American spirit? How can it be captured without stooping to cliches? Ooh, that's a tough call. Like... Evil Dead, like remake, I don't want to say that they couldn't capture the American spirit. I think that they took a more uh, European or Catholic approach to the possession, which the Evil Dead wasn't really about. I think it was more about a uh, Lovecraftian demon, if that makes any sense. And that's what I think is what it just didn't grasp. And I think their dialogue, like, they didn't sound like they were speaking English, like how people talk, like normally, like the dialogue just came on. That's not like the American spirit. It's just like poor dialogue translation where like somebody should have went over every script and like been like, no, don't say that. Like, or the actors just didn't want to be like, that's not what I would say. That's not how people talk here. It happens a lot. Like you'll see it in like a lot of blow budget, like, a, uh, what is that one? Samurai cop stuff like that. You'll see a big time in that, but lesser on big extents like evil dead because they're, uh, they're good at making films and whatnot, but it just doesn't really feel like it, it was written by an American or somebody that understood exactly 110% the evil dead. I don't, I'm not sure what they could do, but except get some people that understand uh, English a little bit better to go over it like five or six times and vice versa. Like if I was, if somebody was writing a movie for like in Italy, I'm sure that tons and tons of times it happens where American is making a movie about Italy and Italians watch it like, what is this, man? This is not how Italians talk. This is not Italian. This is not Italy. Stuff like that. You know, I just mean, I think that they need like uh, somebody in there to go over the dialogue. They always don't work with kids. Uh, 
They say don't always. They say do not work with kids and animals on movies. Would you ever work with either of them as an actor director? Well, I've done a kid, and uh, that sounded terrible. But I've worked with a kid in a movie as a director and an actor, and uh, I don't have any problems. I mean, uh, it was a young girl when we directed the uh, Halloween Spookies. It was my friend's kid, and uh, basically a bunch in the beginning too. In the wraparound segment, I directed that, and uh, it was pretty easy to actually work. But I didn't have to any long shoots or anything like that. You just have to be more patient, which I'm not a very patient person, as you can tell. But you just have to be more patient and uh, whatnot, and uh, it, it went pretty well. And acting with the, I worked with a uh, Cash Allen, which is uh, a, a young actor, and he's a good actor, and he knows all his lines and whatnot. And that was in Rip, and you know, so that was pretty easy. I would do it again, yeah. And animals, I probably would as well. If your voice had to be dubbed, which voice would you pick? <laughs> Not true. A voice closer to mine. Uh, one of the actors you worked with or a famous one, which act I definitely were uh, pick somebody that knew me that could dub me over. Well, that actually knew my presence and who I am. And, you know, um, probably have Dustin or Brandon, Dustin Mills or Brandon South. He'll dub me because I think they would probably be good enough actors to do an impersonation on me. And they understand me, uh, peekaboo, not sure if it's okay to ask. So, so sue if, uh, so sue me if not. Uh, but since you mentioned this last week in 69, I got a reference in my preferred mind. No, no. Not that. Anyway, I was thinking of the ministry song. Um, so my question is, what do you think of ministry and Al Jorgensen? Uh, I, I really don't know much about ministry. Haven't really listened to him. Uh, not really my necessarily my music of choice. You know, I mean, I don't like dislike metal or black metal or whatever kind of metal it is. Sorry, I know they have like a million categories of metal, but or whatever music there is, they are. But um, it's just that I, I'm not like an expert. I don't particularly listen to that by choice. I don't hate it, but I don't really care for it either. So it's just there. I don't know. I don't have really an opinion of it. Brad uh, Homenum, top three or so movies you had, wish had a Blu-ray release any loads of, and loads of features. Well, let's get the, the big dogs out of the way. Martin and Dawn of the Dead. We all want them. We all want the special features. We all want like the deluxe Dawn of the Dead Blu-ray set with the, the uh, theatrical cut, the extended cut, the Euro cut, and the ultimate cut on it. Want it all. Want all the features. Want everything ported over. Uh, we want Martin, um, the international cut, and the English cut put together. I'm the American cut. I want it all. Those are the two like big dog ones I want. I keep calling them big dogs, but, uh, yeah. And then like a bunch of lesser titles I would love to see like Hunter's blood, just like stuff that comes in my mind right away. Uh, a gun for Jennifer, the brain, anything like that. I would love to see uh, the midnight hour is another one, a big one that I'd love to see hit a Blu-ray release. Very fun. Halloween movie. Let's go to that. Okay. Uh, Peter Elligan. I wonder if you've already seen Shane You're talking about Westerns myself. I've always overlooked this movie. I always thought it was old fashioned. Hollywood. damn, I was wrong. But one day I bought the DVD probably a bit 10 years ago and I was amazed how good it was, especially the shootings and the sound of the revolvers. I loved it. Uh, I've not seen Shane. I've always wanted to, um, I, well, I've been more intrigued to see it in the last couple of years, but I haven't had a chance to, I will eventually, and it's on my radar and I'm definitely going to see it probably within this year. So uh, questions for viewers. I, I asked a question. These are you guys. These are all your answers for the questions. I ask: Is there any uh, movie in a franchise or a series of horror movies that you just is a slog to get through that you can't stand? I said Nightmare on Elm Street Part Five and uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Eight. Ben Miller, a movie and series a series that is hard for me to get through every time. The one that sticks out in my head is Romero's Diary of the Dead. Obviously, the bad low budget CG hurt kind of hurt it for me but it's also the sad matter of Romero going along with the trend of the time rather than studying one I don't want to be too hard because it was shot in 24 hours and could have been worse it's all right but the characters kind of suck except for Samuel other other ones were a good chunk of the Friday series after three when Jason gets his mask and is zombified is when it got better for me 20 days later 28 weeks later is kind of rough I've in time grown to love the Phantasm series but there is definite decline in quality with four and five. The last two poltergeists are unfortunate. Other, other than two, I don't think I care for any in the Amityville series. Cube two is annoying and underwhelming. Other than three, I don't have a favorite in the House series. Witchboard three, Wishmaster three, and Night of the Demons three are all atrocities. Atrocious. Zombie five killing birds is just sad. I need to watch more, starting on Elm Street and Hellraiser this year. That will be fun. Oh, I gotta talk about Diary of the Dead. Because when I first saw it, I, I liked it. And then I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, I felt the same way you did. But to be brutally honest, uh, the way Romero talked about how everybody has a voice on the internet and all these voices are coming and just clouding over every half-reasonable thought and, a, and it's just a big muddled mess of garbage, he was right on that. That's definitely what's happening with the internet. And I'm helping. But, uh, you know, I, I think that 
with kind of similar to Day of the Dead, maybe some appreciation will grow with Diary. Because I know my I liked Land when it came out, and I still love Land. I think Land was great, and I think it'll get better with time. I hope the same happens to Diary. I do hate the found footage gimmick, the CGI. That's what really hurt that in survival for me. But maybe it will get better with time. I hope so. And I think that Romero is a very smart guy. And I think that uh, there might be something in there that I didn't see before. But I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I like the Friday movies myself. But 28 weeks later, I was just talking about this with a coworker. I don't like that movie at all either. Like I was watching, I was like, it's not like the the writer and director of this movie never even saw the first movie. I don't think they saw the first movie. It's nothing like the first movie. It doesn't play out. It doesn't follow the same rules. It's just, I hate it. I think it sucks. I don't hate it. I just think it sucks. The opening of that movie is brilliant. Everything else is not good. Uh, what else? I like Night of the Demons 3. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just a poor remake of one, but I like it. John Wilhelm, definitely anything past part two in the Howling franchise. Yeah, I don't even know. I, I remember Howling 6. I've seen that one with the freaks. I always liked that as a kid. Howling 2 is hilarious to me. Howling 3 is ridiculous. 80s film fan. Movies that drag for me within a franchise are Bride of Chucky and See to Chucky. The Exorcist 2. Any Puppet Master flick after 6. Any Hellraiser after 4. Jaws the Revenge, at least three is silly enough to laugh at occasionally. Halloween Resurrection, oh yeah. I actually like all the Friday 13th movies in the original franchise to some extent. Same with The Nightmare on Elm Street, even Freddy's Dead. At that was the first one I saw, so it has nostalgia value for me. Me too, actually, I saw that one first. Mother of Tears and the Three Mothers, I enjoy all Poltergeist movies. Scream 3, except the opening scene, which is great. House 4, I quite, I quite like the horse show. Phantasm Ravenger, there's a few. Yeah, there's some good ones in there. I mean, like, good choices in there, I should say. Uh, yeah, Mother of Tears is definitely a lesser than the other two, but I don't hate it. Uh, Jaws 4 is a turd. Halloween Resurrection, it's one of those ones where, like, I don't even know if I finished it. Like, I saw parts of it, and I was like, eh, no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Scream 3 does suck. Scream 3 is a turd. I mean, I it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I'm sure I wouldn't hate it if I watched it. I would just be like, this is not Scream 1 or 2 quality. Okay, well, we got Paul Wakel. I am also not a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street 5. I've tried to get it through it many times, but it's never anything more than just terrible. People would probably want to kill me for saying this, but I'm not a big fan of Wes Craven's New Nightmare or Freddy vs. Jason either. Nightmare on Elm Street 1 through 4 are excellent. Freddy's Dead is decent. I feel that if Freddy's Dead wouldn't have been so over the top cheesy, it would be on par with a verse 4. I can't hate it, though, because it gave us some great backstory. I really loved seeing Freddy as a youngster. There are the movies I think are eyesores in an otherwise good franchise. Return of the Living Dead 4 and 5. Oh, yeah. And, and any Halloween after Part 6. And I'm also not a huge fan of the Gate 2 or Chud 2. I love the Gate 2 and Chud 2. But uh, they're probably not good. They don't really... They don't really. Gate Chud 2 doesn't fit with the Gate Chud 1 at all. Return of the Living Dead 4 and 5. I say those. Those are not even movies to me. Those are... Ugh. Um, what else is there? Uh, Freddy's Dead is decent. You know, I, I always grew up with Freddy's Dead, so I have a soft spot for it. Or something in here you said that I actually... Yeah, I remember Son of a Thousand Maniacs. Is that the one where we see the flashback with uh, Freddy and the rat uh, as a kid? I always liked that too, to be honest. Nick Mua. I never did like Candyman 3, Day of the Dead. I love Tony Todd and... Uh, Jisoo Gassara, Garcia is a very fine actor, but that movie's all over the place. It's a chore to get through. Predictable, a bit cliche ridden. I've never actually seen uh, Candyman 3. I, I think I've seen parts of 2, and I know I've seen 1, but you know, I don't think I've ever seen that one, so I can't really comment on it. But uh, thanks for the questions, and I love to answer those or read those for you guys. I kind of want to make this a regular segment, me reading those questions. So remember, the question for next week is, are there any horror franchises that are haunted or you think are haunted or series or movies that you think are haunted that are very interesting to you? Let me know which ones interest you and maybe give some details on them. That would be really cool and some theories you have on them. But uh, yeah. Okay, this is the look at the 88 films that someone asked me to do. So... Uh, Please forgive me, this is in the spare bedroom, and uh, all the Blu-rays in the spare bedroom. But this is Sarudi Bames and the Slime Ball Rama, and I had a chance to uh, watch this edition. But uh, let me know if this one's completely uncut, if not, guys, because I know that they said some of that paddling was cut out in the UK edition uh, on the last drive-in. Then we have Flesh Eating Mothers. Not a chance to watch this release either, but I have seen this movie. Sorry for the glare, like I said, this is there's not that many lights in this room, so... But I have seen this movie years ago. Uh, I remember it being okay. Uh, the Suckling. Uh, cool special effects, cool premise. 
this is not a particularly good movie, to be honest. Not for me, but some people do enjoy it. The Oily Maniac. Uh, yeah. I wanted to see this. Didn't know it existed until they announced it. Uh, I, I saw like two weeks about it before about that movie before it was released, and then it was out, and I was like, oh my god, this is already out. I wanted to see this. Well, I know it's an older movie, but I never even heard about it. And then two weeks I hear about it, and then it's out. It's getting announced on Blu-ray. Exciting. Enigma, the Lucio Fulci movie with the snails. This one really feels like Lucio Fulci trying to do his best Dario Argento. I'm a big Lucio fan over Dario, but uh, that movie's not very good. Uh, Amok. Not had a chance to watch this one. It's part of the Italian collection. Like I said, I really haven't watched that many of these uh, editions. Bloodstained Shadow. Also part of the uh, edition. Let me know which editions are actually the best of the bunch out of these releases. Uh, Blade in the Dark by Lamberto Bava. I have seen this movie, but not seen this edition. Not yet, at least. Uh, Body Puzzle. Another Bava. By Lamberto Bava. Not seen that. See, like I said, I haven't had a chance to watch a lot of their stuff. The Cynic, The Rat, and The Fist by Umberto Lenzi. Looks really cool. We got uh, Mad Cop Dog Killer, AK. What is this one? The Beast with the Gun. Is this one, who's the bad guy in this one? I can't think of his name. It's one of those, like, uh, Her Helmut Berger. Yeah, there he is. He uh, plays in The Secret of Dorian Gray, which I love. SS Experiment Camp. I <laughs> heard this is terrible. That's never stopped me before. Uh, Seven Deaths in a Cat's Eye. The Antonio Marighetti movie. Short Night of the Glass Dolls. I heard Twilight Time's doing this over here, but probably won't be rebuying. I haven't had a chance to watch that release. Syndicate Sadist. Another Umberto Lenzi. Touch of Death. A Fulci. I have seen this one. No, I saw Murder Rock. I don't think I've seen Touch of Death. It's one of the only Fulci's I have that I haven't watched. Uh, watch Me When I Kill. And the last... Zombie Flesh Eaters 2, of the Italian collection at least. Uh, I have the Severin release, which I think looks good too. This one looks pretty good. I remember watching both releases. I, I love that movie. Blood Harvest, and I had a chance to watch this one. Uh, Blood Sucking uh, Pharaohs in Pittsburgh. I have seen this movie. I remember it being okay. A lot of people dislike it, but not watch that edition. See, I've seen a lot of these movies, I just haven't had a chance to watch the editions. The Boogeyman. Slasher Collection 88 Films. Not a chance to watch that one either. Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. Been a long time since I've seen this movie. I remember not being particularly great, but hey. The Nail Gun Massacre. Been a long time since I've seen this one too. Very cheap. Don't hate it. Nightmares and a Damaged Brain. I really dig this movie. Not a chance to watch that edition though. Then we have uh, Prazi. Never seen that movie. Didn't hear anything about it until they released it. And uh, Splatter University. Now, I have seen this one. Not this edition, though. <laughs> I remember that movie being okay. But that's my 88, uh, look at my 88 films collection. I know there's a couple more I need. I didn't grab their Massacre in Dinosaur Valley because I heard it was cut. So uh, let me know if that's true as well. But let me know if that Sorority Babes in the Slime bowl -a rama is uncut. But, uh, yeah, guys, like I said, I will show you my collection on any of these, unless it's a huge one like a Kino or something. I'm not doing that. And I, this is all the overlap that I still need to get some more of these shelves. Uh, but, yeah, back to the video. So let's hop into the update. Okay, guys, here's the update. Let's start this off with Ghost Stories. This is a IFC Shout Factory Screen Factory release. Heard cool things about it. Uh, it was good price, so I grabbed it. Don't know much about it. Just like I said, I heard cool things about it. And then You Were Never Really Here with Joaquin Phoenix. Heard good things. I know Elric Kane from Pure Cinema Podcast and Shock uh, Waves said this was really good stuff. So I'm interested. Uh, a lot of people, what's that say? Like the modern day taxi driver. I love taxi driver. Joaquin pretty much never disappointed me ever. So I always thought he's pretty good when I saw him in. I haven't seen him in as much as I'd like, but always thought he was good. Uh, the Bliss by uh, James Bell. You guys know James Bell. He did Manure and uh, what is the other one? All sorts of dog dick. Crazy movies. Crazy, unique, short movies. Very gory. Very splattery. Very weird. Like them. And I also got a book, guys. I uh, 
liked Hunter's Blood, rewatching Hunter's Blood so much, I went ahead. I noticed that there was a novelization by Jer Cunningham, or is that Jerry Cunningham? But uh, yeah, called Hunter. It's the book, obviously, Hunter's Blood. Beat to crap, but right in the beginning, it's kind of excited me to check this out. Uh, the novelization of Hunter's Blood. I didn't even know there was one until I started watching this movie. But uh, right in the beginning, I'm going to read this part to you. The hunting party, Mason, the most experienced, the most guts, a man of quiet courage and action. David, his son, an intern at a big city hospital. Hunting helped him to recapture his boyhood until the creatures came. Al, big shot, loud mouth. He meant well, but he was short on guts when the chips were down. Ralph, his real target was Brother Al. Their quarreling endangered everyone. Jimmy, rich Yankee who talked big to cover his inexperience. The weakest link. I'm excited to check it out. Uh, yeah, I love Rich Yankee. You know what I mean? Come on, guys. And uh, it's so funny that the, like a lot of Southern people or a lot of Southern like things just call everybody. Yankee. Even Burt Reynolds in the in the special features on Gator and White Lightning would use the term Yankee, and it's just like, is that derogatory? I don't know. I don't, I'm not mad about it. It's funny to me, but uh, yeah. I'm excited to check out that book. I love, uh, you know, um, that kind of stuff, like the wilderness, uh, man, gang, clan versus clan stuff. But, yeah, back to the video, guys. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one. Mm.